this exponential pace that will keep this going for a very long time. And within 16 years, eight more doublings, we can meet all of the world's energy needs. And we thought this was very intriguing and uh, announced yesterday a uh, national commission to really accelerate this process. But people tend to dismiss exponential progressions when they're at a small stage. Uh, the, the general project was announced in 1990. Mainstream scientists said, there's no way you're going to sequence the entire human genome in 15 years. We've just had our best scientists and most advanced equipment. And around the world, we collected one ten thousandths of the genome in 1989. Halfway through the project, the skeptics were going strong, saying, I told you this wasn't going to work. <coughs> Here you are halfway through the project, and you've only finished 1% of the project, kind of where solar energy is today. But that was right on schedule for an exponential progression. It had been doubling every year, but you start out doubling little numbers. By the time you get to 1%, you're only seven doublings away from 100%. It continued to double every year. The cost came down by half every year. It was $10 per base pair in 1990. It's a small fraction of a penny today. The project was done a year ahead of schedule. And every other aspect of biological technologies are gearing up in this exponential manner. And Israeli technologies are in the lead in many of these areas. When BB and I were students at MIT some decades ago, we all shared a computer, took up half a building, cost tens of millions of dollars. The computer in my cell phone today is a million times cheaper, it's a million times smaller, it's a thousand times more powerful than, than the computer BB and I shared some decades ago. That's a billion fold increase in the amount of computation per shekel, per dollar, uh, as of a few years ago. We'll do that again in 25 years. We'll, as powerful as these devices are already, we'll multiply them another billion fold in the next 25 years. So what used to fit in the building now fits in my pocket. What fits in my pocket today will fit inside a blood cell 25 years ago. We're going to be putting these intelligent computers inside our bodies and brains. If that sounds very futuristic, I'd point out that we're already doing that. If you're a Parkinson's patient, put a computer inside your brain. Today, some of this technology has been pioneered here in Israel. It actually replaces the biological neurons destroyed by that disease. The latest generation actually allows you to download new software to the computer inside your brain from outside the patient. It's not blood cell size today, it's pea size. But we're going to shrink that 100,000 fold over the next 25 years. So these will be the size of a blood cell in 25 years. Now, it was mentioned earlier that you can't predict the future. That's true if you talk about when a war is going to break out, which company is going to be successful. But if you talk about the underlying power of these technologies, the number of bits you can buy for a dollar of computation, the number of bits per dollar, the number of bits we're moving around on the internet, the number of bits of data we're getting about the brain, the special, spatial resolution of brain scanning, the power of biological technologies. I could mention 50 other things that are basically measuring the power of information technology, not just with these electronic gadgets, but in many different fields, they follow very predictable trajectories. I started studying this 30 years ago because I realized the timing was successful to being an event, and I wanted to see if I could predict where technologies would be so that I could meet that moving train. Because the key to being successful is timing. Larry Page and Search and Brain had a great idea about search engines, but they did it at exactly the right time. So I began to study technology trends. I looked at many different technologies. And I wasn't expecting to see a, a ready formula that would predict it, but I thought maybe we could get some idea of where technology would be. And I made a rather startling discovery. If you look at these underlying measures of the power of information technology, they follow exquisitely predictable trajectories. In the case of computers, this goes back 120 years to the 1890 American census. Very smooth exponential growth, doubling every few years. Now it's doubling every 11 months. Uh, that, that describes the trajectory of, the, of these technologies. And what we can predict is that they grow exponentially, and that's not intuitive. Our intuition is that technology or that everything progresses in a linear manner. If I take third, but there's a profound difference between our intuitive linear perspective and the historically correct exponential perspective. If I take 30 steps linearly, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and that reflects our intuition about technology, I get to 30. If I take 30 steps exponentially, 2, 4, 8, 16, 
and that reflects the reality of this progress, they get to a billion. It makes a huge difference. That's why my predictions about, about these technologies are surprising to people. In the early 1980s, I saw the predecessor to the internet, it was called the ARPANET, after the US Defense ARPA Agency, doubling every year. But it was only tying together a few thousand scientists. But I did the math and projected a worldwide web connecting hundreds of millions of people to each other and vast knowledge resources emerging in the mid-1990s. People thought that was ridiculous when the entire American defense budget could only tie together 2,000 scientists in a year. But it happened right on schedule. That's the power of exponential growth. Doubling every year means multiplying by 1,000 in 10 years, a million in 20 years. And it's not just these gadgets we carry around. It affects everything we care about. And an important area is health and medicine. <clears throat> Health and medicine was not an information technology up until just recently. It was hit or miss. We would just find things that happened to work, but we really didn't understand why they worked. Uh, now, it is an information technology. We have the human genome, which I mentioned. That was an exponential progression. That represents the software that life is based on. Now, how long do you go without updating the software on your cell phone? It updates itself every few days. But we have software running in our body, our genes, that are thousands of years old, in some cases millions of years old. One example, the fat insulin receptor gene, says hold on to every calorie because the next hunting season may not work out so well. That, that, that was a good idea a thousand years ago. We had no refrigerators, we stored our, our food in our bodies. Today that underlies an epidemic of obesity, especially in my country. Well, we'd like to be able to tell the fat insulin receptor gene, don't store every calorie. We, we'll have enough calories tomorrow. That was actually tried. We have technologies that can do that in animal experiments near where I work in Boston, Massachusetts, the Joshua Diabetes Center. These animals <coughs> ate ravenously. They ate a lot while remaining slim. And it wasn't a fake slimness. They didn't get diabetes. They didn't get heart disease. They lived 20% longer. They got the benefits of eating less while eating more. And there's several pharmaceutical companies rushing to bring that to the human market. That's just one of the 23,000 genes we'd like to consider changing uh, to be consistent with our modern world today and extend human longevity. There are genes that we can turn off that promote heart disease and cancer and aging processes. There's genes we'd like to add that would protect us from those things. And we have new technologies now that can change our genes, not just in a newborn, but in a mature individual. RNA interference, which has got the Nobel Prize, can turn genes off. New forms of gene therapy can add new genes. And I'll talk tomorrow a little bit uh, before our dialogue how these technologies work. We can design them on computers. We can test them out on biological simulators that can simulate and predict what things will do inside the human body. And these are gearing up exponentially. Now, all of these things I've mentioned are in an early stage.